thanks for the, for the warm welcome. And it's summertime in Vienna and this is so great. And I have to admit, I like the city. And I arrived this afternoon and I had like two or three hours to walk through the city and I've um, got a little story for you in pictures. I went there, then I went there. Afterwards, I went there, Hofburg, right, it was great. I went there, Stephens Cathedral. And I went there, the Butterfly House. And then, yeah, I was finished. I like Vienna, I have to admit that. Summer in Vienna is great, it's my second time here, but I'm afraid I can't impress you with uh, like pictures of your own city. So let's talk about something else that is Angola. And I love Angola and I am sure that you love Angola as well and you love developing single page applications with Angola as well. And I developed a little single page application on the train to Vienna and it's this one. It's nothing special. It's a list of things I've got to, at home. And we can display the details, which are exactly the same, but it doesn't really matter. It's a list, it's a detail that's like the standard type of um, business application that we have. But let's take a look into the source code. That is a single page application. And a single page application always works like that. We've got an almost empty HTML page and the only thing that is, in, that is special inside this HTML page is that app root element, which is like the host element for the root component of the Angular application. And that means everything that happens within, within the Angular application's ha application happens within that root element. And there's no more HTML in this application. So our single page application always looks like that, empty HTML page, and the actual content comes in via JavaScript. And this is very important because I will do something very weird now. I will disable JavaScript in my browser. Yeah, I know, this is weird. So I've got this, and I reload it, and this is how like my grandpa sees um, his web pages with his old IE6 browser or anything. But who on earth? disables JavaScript in 2019, what do you guess? No one, right? I thought so as well, I will reactivate it so um, I can surf tomorrow. But who on earth disables JavaScript in 2019? Well, exactly, search engines. That's not exactly right. So search engines like rendering JavaScript but only for high-ranked sites. The Google bot, for my little personal blog, ignores all the JavaScript. It just gets the HTML page and looks at it and sees, okay, there's HTML, there's a bit of JavaScript, but it's too big, it's like 10 megabytes, I won't download this just for a personal blog and everything I see is the blank page. And this is bad because I wrote some great blog articles and the Googlebot doesn't see it. Yeah, that's not great. So, yeah, another thing. The first meaningful pain, have you heard of that? What does that mean? That is the time that goes from starting the page to the first visible thing that is in some way meaningful to the user. And when we've got an Angular application that is being bootstrapped in the browser, it takes some time until the first meaningful pane is being established. And that can be like two seconds, three seconds, but most of the users tend to leave the page if the page isn't rendered after two or three seconds. So maybe that's a bad thing and maybe we could improve when it comes to here. And you already see we've got a loading indicator here. So there is a way to render content before the Angular application kicks in, but we need to know how we render it at this situation, but we will see. Who else is visiting our page except for real users? What do you think? Any ideas? Who is visiting our Angular application? Except for search engines and users. Exactly, the site privy on Twitter, Facebook, Slack, whatever your favorite social media and messenger thing is. The site preview, yes, when we post our blog articles in social media, they fetch a preview or they fetch the contents to generate a preview so that users can see it in the news feed. But when there's no content on the page, of course, no news feed can be generated. And that's a real problem. So how can we tackle this problem? First solution could be don't do single page applications. Well, but that's yeah, like a bad advice at an Angular meetup. So what else could we do? We could make this host element not be empty. And of course we could just write something down there like 
loading or this is my page. It will load in a second when Angular has been kicked in. But what about rendering this content dynamically on the server so that search engines and the site preview already see a meaningful content and then when Angular kicks in and takes over the page, the Angular application is up and running and works as usual. But in the meantime, we see a meaningful content. And that's what we want to talk about today. And we call this server-side rendering. I brought a quote. I love quotes. When you are in one of my workshops, I bring quotes on like every topic. And I brought a quote by the good guy Mike Hartington. And he summed it up very well because he said, server-side rendering doesn't have the ability to improve the app's performance because you have to download more HTML in the end and it's the exact same application. But you can make the app accessible for search engines and social media services. And you can even improve the first meaningful paint time so the user sees something more while um, they are waiting. And that's good. Let's talk about this. And I will tell you three different strategies on how to achieve this. First, I will tell you how to do this with a normal browser and uh, using it as a normal browser and grabbing the HTML from that pre-rendering with a real browser. Then the second thing is dynamic server-side rendering. So on request, we render the page and bring it back to the user. And the second and the third thing is static pre-rendering. We do all the stuff at build time, but we will come to that. Let's talk about me for a second. My name is Ferdinand Malcher. I'm from Leipzig, Germany. It's my second time in Vienna. And I'm uh, a self-employed software developer, trainer, conference speaker, book author, everything that is there to do about Angular. I am one of the co-authors of this amazing book that uh, has just been released in the second version a few weeks ago. It was mid-June, I think, so it was just a few weeks ago. And you can take this book home if you want in the raffle. Michael already said it. That's very cool. And I'm a co-founder of Angular Schule. We do everything around Angular. Angular training, Angular workshops, Angular consulting. Um, we can help you on the phone if you want. Everything around Angular. So if you need help, just call us. Um, we're here for you. OK. Server-side rendering. And let's first talk about the pre-rendering with a real browser. The idea is very, very simple. We just take a real browser, Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Edge, Opera, Opera Mini, whatever, Samsung browser, we take a real browser and just open our page. Send an HTTP request to our page and we get back the application bundles from the server. And then we fetch the HTML from the generated DOM tree and save it to somewhere. For example, to the file system or we just send it to the user. And the big deal for that is that it's so simple. Of course, it's not that simple to set it up. And that's why there is a service for that, which calls itself prerender.io. It's a paid service. You can use it for free within a limited range. But if you want to achieve things like that very easily, prerender.io is here for you. It works as follows. When we send a request to our application, there is a middleware on our web server that checks whether our application is being accessed by a bot or by a crawler or by a site preview from social media or whatever. And if so, the request is being forwarded to the pre-render IO web service. And this service has a real browser. Of course, it is headless and it doesn't have a window or anything, but this browser makes a request to our application, gets back the application bundles and renders the application in a real browser and then sends back the reciting HTML to the client or to the, to the middleware on the server and then through this to the client. So the client doesn't really notice that there is pre-render IO as a man in the middle or a woman in the middle, but the client actually gets the exact HTML of the page with the real content if it's a bot. So you get everything solved for the bot. Of course, this is a great solution because it is so easy, but in the end, we can do it with whatever page we want. We can do it with React, Vue, jQuery, AngularJS, whatever. I guess you have a jQuery site somewhere. <laughs> I know you. Um, it doesn't really matter because it's just, an, uh, just a browser, nothing special. But I want something more Angular involved. So I want to control what happens. I want to render something on the server and don't want to render something in the browser or on the server or whatever. I, I want to have the control over things. And this is where the server-side rendering comes in. Pre-rendering 
with pre-render IO is always a solution if nothing else works. But server-side rendering is much better when you have the control over the whole infrastructure. The idea is the following. When a client sends a request to the server, the server doesn't just send, send the application bundles back, but it renders the whole application. And not within a browser, but like Angular is JavaScript, right? You can run JavaScript on the server with Node.js. And so you can run your Angular application on the server as well. So it bootstraps the application and sends back the resulting HTML in an index HTML page to the client. So the client sees the contents while the application bundles are being downloaded. And after that, Angular kicks in and takes over the page and then it is there as always. It's the main idea. When talking about that, we can leverage the platform independency of Angular. So of course, we can run Angular in a browser. That's what we always do. But we can run Angular as well on all platforms that support JavaScript in any way. And that is mobile phone. And I'm not talking about a browser on a mobile phone, but natively. Yeah? The keyword is native script. Of course, we can also run it on IoT devices if we've got a JavaScript interpreter there. And we can also run Angular on a server because it's just JavaScript in the end. The project that achieves that is called Angular Universal, and you can find it in the at angular uh, slash platform server package. And it works as follows. First, we've got our very simple application, and every application has an app module. And within there, there are our components and feature modules and everything that our application consists of. This app module also imports the browser module. Very important, so the Angular application can run in a browser. And what also happens is that all this is being put together in a main.ts file. This is called bootstrapping. So the Angular application boots up in the main.ts file, and this is also the entry point for the Webpack build. That's a standard Angular application. Every application looks like that. Now, what we do for the server is we wrap the whole application in another module we call app server module. And this app server module imports the native server module from Angular. So this is the part that fits for the server and the other part fits for the browser. And then we create another file that acts as an entry point for a second Webpack build. And that means we need to create two builds, one for the client and one for the, or one for the browser and one for the server of the exact same application. This is because the platforms, the platforms are different to each other, right? Browser is different from Node.js, so different builds for that. How does it look in the code? We've got the app server module, and it, it's nothing else than an empty module that imports the app module and imports the server module, and that's it, right? It's like the app module, but for the server side. The second part is the main server TS, which is the entry point, the second entry point for the Webpack build. That thing just exports our app server module and some dependencies we need. We'll come back to that later. But the main thing is that it exports our whole application for being rendered, rendered on the server. The third thing is a change in our app module. Before, we were just importing the browser module there but now we need to import browser module with server transition. This is necessary because our client needs to know that this is an application that's being taken over from a server. So there is a server rendered application and the client just, just puts itself up on that and takes over the application that has already been rendered on the server. And that's why this is necessary. It's also necessary to create a new configuration in your Angular JSON so you can build your application for the server. And of course, you have to install packages and you have to create a TS config for the server, so for the server bundle you create. And I'm totally with you if that is utterly complex. And it is, it is definitely. But what comes to the rescue? Starting from Angular 6, we've got schematics, and of course, there's schematics for setting all this up, and this is done via ng at ng universal express engine. And I will demonstrate to you how this will look like. Just find my shell. 
Oh yeah, that's where I put it. Okay, so I, I cancel the ng-surf command and then just do the ng-add. ng-add just installs another library in your application and runs some scripts that will install themselves into your application. So what this script does is it installs everything I just showed you in our application that exists. And what we need to provide is an option called client project, which just says which project in your workspace we mean to server, server render and stuff, right? Nothing special. Okay, now it takes a few seconds to install all that, but in the meantime, we can take a look at the generated files and it's exactly what I showed you. We've got a main server TS. You see here, export app server module. We've got the app server module itself. We've got the build options in the Angular JSON. It's there. We've got some additional scripts and dependencies in your package JSON. And all that stuff, I showed you everything that happened here. So nothing special about that. Everything is set up. That's very cool. Now, we've got a Angular application, and now we need to build it. And you already know how to build the client. That is the ng-build command as you know it. ng-build dash dash prod. And I just do it. ng-build dash dash prod. This is the step you already know. It will put the build artifacts in the dist folder and we can just put it on the server from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. And the second one is that we do the same for the server part. So we just built our application for the browser and now we build our application to run it on a server. It's different because the platforms are different. It's very important. That's the thing. And then we have in our dist folder two folders, one for the browser and one for the server. Okay, just we built our application twice. Okay, next thing we need is a server. The minimal thing we could do is just serving all the files from the browser folder statically. And that's what we wanna do at first. We need to provide the application bundles to the client as a simple web server. But the second one, or here on the slide it's the first one, the second one is we need to pre-render our application whenever a request comes in. So we've got that main JS that is being rendered for the server and our task now on the server is to bring up the Angular application and get the HTML from it and send it to the, to the browser as soon as a request comes in. We always need Node.js for that because Node.js is the only sufficient way of running JavaScript on a server. But if you uh, develop your backend with .NET Core or Spring Boot or whatever, <laughs> there are wrappers that invoke Node.js in the background. So you always need Node.js, but you can do it from whatever technology you want, as long as there's a wrapper. Now let's take a look at how such a server script with Node.js could look like. We first need a very simple express server. We could take another framework if you want, but uh, express is um, sufficient for that. That's cool. We just um, instantiate it and then listen on port like 4000 or whatever. We've got a server running. The next thing is that we statically serve the files from the browser folder, of course, because we need our application up and running as soon as a request comes in. That's the normal thing. And now we have a simple web server that just serves our application. Nothing special about that. And now comes the interesting part. Because we register a so-called Express engine. And that engine is a script that tells Express how to render specific HTML. And what we put, what we put in there is our application. That is the rendered application as we compiled it a second ago. And everything is hidden within that ng-express engine function. 
So we register that view engine called HTML. And then the next step, we tell Express to use that engine whenever a request comes in and something needs to be rendered. And that's that route. So every route that um, can't be handled by serving it statically will be handled by the ng express engine. And what we render is our index HTML. So Express takes the index HTML, which is empty, and brings Angular within that into that page. So it bootstraps our Angular application, does it as it is in the browser, and then we've got HTML, and that is being returned to the client automatically. It's everything built in there. And that's it. That's all we need. And the cool thing is that all of that has already been prepared by the schematic script. So when we take a look at the server TS, we've got everything here. Of course, I skipped a few imports, but we've got the Express Engine here, we've got the routes, and we've got the app listen. So what we can do is we can start the server. But before we can start the server, we first need to compile the TypeScript to JavaScript. And we can use TSC for that, but we can also use Webpack to bundle everything together. And the good thing is that everything for Webpack and bundling the server part is already prepared as well. Let's take a look at the package JSON. Here's a script, compile server, that just takes a Webpack server config. And within the Webpack server config, it says, take the server TS and bundle everything together. So let's just call this. npm run compile server. The output of that is a is a server JS file within the dist folder. And all we need to do is to run that file. So note dist server. It starts on port 4000, and then I go to the browser. You see the application running on port 4200 is not running anymore, but instead I change it to 4000. Here's our application, and now there's the proof. Here's the server side rendering in progress, up and running with no effort, and that's really cool. You see, this is generated HTML from our page. So when the Google bot comes to that page and sees it, they see all our content as well. And that's really cool. OK. I've done that, done that. And let's recap what we did. We send a request to the server. And on the server, the Angular application is being bootstrapped, rendered, and afterwards destroyed. And that happens on every request. And that's why there's a better idea of rendering rather static pages. Because when you think about the contact form or the legal section or like the GDPR section on your page, there's no changes in there or those changes are, are not very often, right? And you don't need to render all of them on every request. And that's why we do static pre-rendering as well as a third strategy. The idea of static pre-rendering is similar but instead, we do all of that at build time and not at runtime. So what we do is the build server bootstraps and renders and destroys our application and saves the resulting HTML to the file system. And those generated files, this is what we send to the server or what we bring to the server, deploy to the server. And then when the client requests dashboard, they just get dashboard index HTML pre-rendered. And there's, there's no effort in that. We don't need anything more than a simple web server for serving those files. Of course, our build server has to be like big because we need Node.js, we need to render those, um, those routes, uh, those applications, and all that stuff. But we don't need more than a simple web server at runtime. That's really cool. Also, we have less computing work at runtime because we don't need to render the, um, the freaking application every time. But on the other hand, we can't render dynamic content because everything is being done at build time and you don't build every second, right? You do it once a day or once a week or whenever changes are there. So the um, pre-rendering part 
is rather for static content and the dynamic server-side rendering part is rather for dynamic content. And of course you can mix those two. You can go the hybrid approach. Another downside of the static pre-rendering is also that you need to know what routes you want to render at build time. So when you have dynamic content, like blog posts, you always need to round trip to your database, retrieve the list of blog posts, and bring that back to your build script so that all the single blog posts can be rendered. But go for the hybrid approach. Do all the static pre-rendering for your static pages and do the dynamic server-side rendering for your dynamic pages. It's easy as that. The idea of that is that we have a list of routes and this one is predefined by configuration. So we know we've got the dashboard that is static, we've got the imprint and the legal and GDPR uh, section. Those are all static. And then out of that list of routes, we generate a folder structure that reflects the exact same paths. So when someone requests item slash bat, they get the index HTML from the item and bat subfolder. Okay? The core of this idea is a function called render module factory. And the render module factory directly comes from Angular platform browser and does nothing else than returning the HTML for a rendered application. So this is also the core for the ng-express engine. The ng-express engine just encapsulates the render module factory. But we use it directly now. And what we do is we first define our list of routes. And then for each route, we run a script. And in the script, we invoke the render module factory. So we bootstrap our application, render it, get the HTML from it, and destroy it afterwards. Then we've got the HTML. And then we need to save that HTML to the file system. And that is done via this um, FSWrite file down here. It's a very naive implementation. You can do it better, but for demo purposes, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's easy as that. And then I can show you how that behaves when we try it out. I prepared everything we need. And it's the exact same script I showed you, but I skipped the imports as well. We've got the list of routes. We've got the for each. And we've got the function render route, which just invokes render module factory and saves everything to the file system. In order to be able to use this, we need to extend our application a bit because we need the function render, render module factory and we need to export that from our main server TS. So I need the render module factory from at Angular platform server. And what I need to do now is to rebuild my bundles because I just integrated another dependency in there. So I just start this in the meantime. Um, Yep, rebuild the server, that's cool. And then I need another Webpack build for my pre-render TS. And this is very easy to do. I just extend my Webpack config, put in another entry point, now pre-render TS, and I think that's it. Let's wait for the application to be rendered. That looks cool, and then Let's do again npm run compile server. So it reruns the server compiling and generates the server JS and also for the second entry point, the pre-render JS that is being generated. You can see it here. Yep, pre-render TS has been processed. And now the interesting part comes in node dist pre-render. It says nothing, that is good. <laughs> But let's take a look at the dist folder. Now, in the browser folder, we've got subfolders, dashboard, and item. And for every item, we've got a index HTML. And within there, we've got the whole pre-rendered HTML. It's not very, very um, impressing for that simple application, but let's take a look at the, the dashboard HTML. There's lots of stuff in there. And that is just, this is just statically um, lying around in my file system. So what I can do is, 
I go to that specific folder, dist browser, and start a simple HTTP server here. It's listening on port 8080. So port 8080, here I got my application and this is completely static. Of course there's JavaScript in there, but when I disable JavaScript now, I still see the exact same application because it has been pre-rendered at build time. And that's what the Googlebot wants to see, right? Improve it, here's my content. So, server-side rendering lets you provide content, initial content for server, um, for search engines and for social media site preview or for messenger site preview, whatever. It could increase the perceived performance. As I said, it doesn't increase the performance at all because there's more HTML that's being transferred from the server to the client. But while the Angular application hasn't been loaded yet, the user already sees those, um, those pre-rendered HTML and they see some meaningful content that is cool for user um, experience. And the tooling around that is really, really simple. I just put in a few commands. Of course, you need to know those commands, but that's why I showed them to you. Um, and everything is generated for us. We don't need to, need to uh, write all the code for ourselves. That has been different a year ago. I did um, like a similar talk a year ago and it was completely different because I needed to live code like everything. And it was not cool. And now it's really easy to do a talk about that because it's just hammering commands and here it is, cool. Um, the downsides are you always need Node.js. So if you want to do dynamic server-side rendering, you always need a Node.js server. And if you look into the future, the IV renderer is coming or you all know, the IV support for server-side rendering is still a bit hacky. So there are examples on how to do it, but it's not officially supported yet. That will come probably, of course it will come, but you can't use it at the moment. Okay. That's what I want to tell you about server-side rendering. And I've got um, one more thing, a question that always arises when I talk about server-side rendering, and that is when to use it and when not to use it. And the answer is very simple. If it's a public-facing application that your users access through a link, then server-side rendering could be a good idea. When it's an internal one, like in the internet, or it is the account section in a public facing website that will never be crawled by a search crawler because search crawlers can't log in into your site. Of course, you don't need to server side render your account section, but just the public facing sites. And then for all the dynamic content, please do server side rendering. So the, uh, the, the content is really up to date when the user retrieves it. And for all the static pages, just do pre-rendering as I showed you in the last section. You can find all the demo code here in the GitHub repo. So try it out, play around with it, and have fun with SSR because it's really simple. And once you've dug into it um, and have understood it completely, it's very cool. So it works transparently. We just run our application on the server. And now when you try it out, or when you look into the source code, you will find something called lazy module map. And lazy sounds a bit like lazy loading, and lazy loading, as you might know, is the number one thing of performance optimization in Angular applications. And that's why I want to talk about lazy loading a minute, then I'm finished. <laughs> lazy loading and server-side rendering. So what's the problem? We always generate one single bundle for the server, but when we do lazy loading, we have several bundles for every module we lazy load. How does that fit together? Right? Those are two different worlds and we need to find an interface between those two worlds. And that is done via the so-called module map loader module. Yeah? It's like you can turn it around and it's almost the same module map loader module. But what it does, it, what it does is it automatically generates a so-called lazy module map. And this is, this is just a, a map where it says where to find the lazy loaded modules within the big application bundle. So we generate it, and on the server side, we just use it. We put it in as a provider, as you all know from the Angular world, 
provide module map, put in the, the lazy module map, and that's it. That's a thing that is already prepared if you use the schematics. So let's take a look at the server TS. We've got the lazy module map here. But when you set up SSR, SSR by hand, you might forget it and you might wonder why the, why the lazy loading doesn't work. So that's the solution. It doesn't work in any other way than that, but I think it's okay to implement a module. And that's the end of my talk. You can follow me on Twitter. Thanks for coming. It's great to be here in Vienna. And yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>